Okay, Assalamu alaikum everyone, good evening. Thanks so much for coming down to our talk this evening entitled Forced Marriages, The Real Dishonour. Um, it seems somewhat surreal and actually sort of disturbing to be discussing this in, uh, in the UK or even in London in 2015. Sadly, it is an issue uh, not just within uh, sort of, uh, the sort of global community but also within the UK, which we'll be addressing. And um, I think one of the things to emphasise is it's not just something despite the media's efforts and the emphasis there that exists within the Muslim community or the Southeast Asian community. Um, it is actually sort of a, unfortunately a global issue. Um, two thoughts I have in mind, that two things that strike me from the outset. Um, one is that I think what makes, this, what makes forced marriages particularly alarming or disturbing is the perpetrators of the crimes are uh, essentially the people who are closest to the victims. Uh, and people that those victims have trusted uh, for most of their, all of their lives up to that point. Um, and that's, I think, a great sort of letdown in trust, which there are other issues, of course, that, you know, we've, we've talked about in the past, abuse being one of them, which is also in that case. But it, it's a great, grave, uh, grave letdown of trust. The other thing that, again, I want to think about and just sort of put out there, um, which, again, may not necessarily always fall within the legal sort of strict definition of forced marriages, which will be touched upon, is both in the manifestation of forced marriages and the effect is, is a spectrum uh, of actually how it plans out. So in the former, you have the extreme cases where you have individuals, in many cases below the age of 18, uh, who are forced, and often without their knowledge, to, to, to basically be thrown to someone else. But then you have also the other end of the spectrum, where there are people who maybe are put under psychological pressure uh, and almost emotional blackmail. And that's actually something that, you know, we may know people who have been on that, so you have to marry this person because otherwise I'll be upset to your father. Which is obviously more subtle, but actually that's something that's not always picked up in statistics and can be equally insidious. And then in the latter, which is the effect, again, you have the extreme scenarios where the situation can in, in, end in sort of, uh, it's either abuse, sexual assault, uh, domestic violence, and even death in some circumstances. But again, you have the other element, which is again not always picked up in statistics, but it can be again equally uh, alarming, which is then this individual's life, their ambitions have been put aside, their education has to be stopped, uh, and they're living a life of misery. Um, so it's, it's, it's a broad spectrum and it's not, so it's not necessarily the extreme things that we would detach from and maybe the other end of the spectrum are things that we perhaps know people who have been exposed to more. Um, to discuss this topic, i uh, delighted to be joined by three speakers. Uh, the first is Shabana Saleem, who's a pupil barrister at Four Paper Buildings, practicing international family law. And she's dealt with many cases of uh, honour crimes and forced marriages. Um, then we've got Polly Harar who's the founder of the Sharon Project, which is a UK-based charity providing support for women who have been disowned by their families and communities. Uh, and finally, we've got Asha Patel, who's an activist against sexual child abuse and honour-related crimes. Um, in terms of the format, we'll start with a short film um, uh, looking at this area, and then each of the speakers will have about 10 minutes, uh, and then we'll open up uh, to, the, to the floor as well. Just some terms of general housekeeping as well. So we're going to film the beginning, but we'd request no photographs or videos for, for this throughout, because at some stages some of the speakers wouldn't, don't want to be filmed. Uh, and of course, as always, we'll be live tweeting, so if you do want to join in the discussion, uh, the hashtag is CC Talks. And so without further ado, we're going to start off with a short uh, video. I keep telling them I'm too young. I just thought we were going on holiday. 
It's not like I'm going to do something bad at this one, Robo. I know my parents are traditional, but I thought they loved me more than their traditions. <clears throat> my husband hit me. Pulled my hair. The day after our wedding, my sister killed herself. I just want to finish my studies and become a grown-up. I'm a good girl. But then they found her body. And later, her uncle was charged with her murder. I still don't believe this is happening here now, in the 21st century. And why do they call it honor? I had a baby before I was 17. I'm so scared. It will happen to me when my time comes. I left home, but I know I'll never see my parents again, and I, I miss them. I was really good at school. I had loads of dreams when I was little. I wanted to be a painter, and then I wanted to be a vet. I swear, I even wanted to be Prime Minister. Sure, I wanted to get married one day and have children, but only when I'm ready and only to a person that I loved. Is that a crime? Quite a somber video. Um, and I'm not sorry to start on such a serious note because it is a serious topic. Um, why am I here today? Now we all know that forced marriage is wrong. We all know that it's a crime. The reason why I'm here today to speak to you is because we failed to address it as a crime. These stories of these stories from these various women are not limited to women of this age. We saw women that might be older, young adults, or maybe in their 20s or 30s, but this goes down to 12, 13, 14 year olds. And it can also affect people that are in their 30s or 40s. It also affects men, so it's a very broad um, crime that has no common theme about it. Now, if I can ask you all, what do you think are the top six countries in which forced marriage is the most prevalent? Any guesses? Pakistan? Yes, Pakistan's at the top. India? That's second. You've got to do this reading out of your phone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I'm on Twitter. 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 I'm on
Um, we've got cases within China. It's, it's a broad, very broad um, crime. But there's one action that we can all take, and that's really the reason why I'm here today. There's something that we can all do this weekend, this week, and that's talk. The reason why the top six countries remain the biggest offenders, the reason why there are common communities along which this is the most prevalent, is because while this is very often talked about outside of these communities, it's very little talked about within the community. So if nothing else, I hope that you learn something from today and go back and talk, whether it's to your parents, siblings, aunties, uncles, cousins. Um, education really, and lack thereof, is the biggest reason why we are failing to combat this as much as we should. Holly will talk to you a bit more about the, the statistics of it, which are quite frightening. Um, but moving on to the education itself. Now, I'm going to broadly speak on three main things because I have to give you a quick whistle stop tour of a lot of complex issues. Um, I'm going to talk about the past, the present and the future. So how we've dealt with it in the past, what we're doing with it now and what the issues are going to be coming up in respect of forced marriage. Now the first thing is that it was quite an alien concept when it first was reported and cases came to light. Um, cases often quote this American writer who gives the best metaphor for it. Where a formal consent is brought by force, menace or duress, a yielding of the lips but not of the mind, it is of no legal effect. Now this is applicable to all contracts and there is no exception to marriage. That's really the starting point, is that you can say yes to marriage, but it doesn't mean anything if you've been forced to do it. Now, how the courts define force has changed a lot. In the first few cases, we had a lot of young men and women coming to court and asking for the court to annul their marriage or nullify it because they'd been forced. Their families had emotionally blackmailed them. And that didn't count because originally it was only abuse and duress. And that meant you had to be physically threatened. Your life, limb or liberty had to be threatened. You had to feel like you were in danger. That's changed over time. And as as I mentioned, there is a spectrum. That spectrum is now recognised as starting with assisted marriages, where people might be introduced through the families, arranged marriages, where the, the actual arrangement is made between the families, and then forced marriage. Now, when I mentioned the spectrum of forced marriage itself, he mentioned it can be emotional blackmail. You know, you are going to dishonour the family, you are going to bring shame on us. Um, that can get more serious into, we'll commit suicide, we'll kill ourselves if you don't do what we need you to do. And then it can go more serious still. Some cases of there being rape, of there being murder, of there being honest suicide is what you call it, because these victims have no other recourse, or they feel they don't. So that's really the definition of it. There have been a lot of cases and you'd be surprised to know that actually some of the cases started in the 1920s. Um, I couldn't give you, in I think I have about 10 minutes, um, a good summary of each of these. So if you want to shout out the names that look the most interesting, you know, the name that looks the most interesting. The first one. The first one. Lee and Lee, that's, I think, probably the one that I find most interesting because it involves a young Caucasian woman who had become pregnant by her boyfriend. And her father had found out, found out who the boyfriend was, taken a rifle and threatened him and said, if you don't marry my daughter, I'm basically going to kill you. So, of course he did. The girl, the daughter, had no idea what dad had done. And after the marriage, he came to court and said, please nullify this marriage. I didn't really consent to it, I was forced. And the court did. So, first to show, it's not really a South Asian issue alone. Um, any other cases? Sector and sector. Ah, two Polish people. So, country was under communist rule, and this couple had to marry while they were in prison so they could escape, essentially. Um, they did get married, they later immigrated to England, and they asked for that marriage to be annulled over here because they were coerced into doing it, they were under duress. Again, Poland, you would never really think that's somewhere where forced marriage might take place, but it does take place in a lot of Eastern European countries. 
Any other cases that might interest you? One or more? No? I'll play ball. Sing and core. Sing and core. This one. So this was a 21-year-old Sikh man. So you've actually chosen none of the common stereotypes. None of these cases are... Actually, there were two cases that were young Asian women, but you haven't picked them. This was a young Asian man who came to court and said, my family forced me, they're emotionally blackmailing me because if I didn't get married, they would disown me, they would cut me off financially, they would force me to no longer be part of the family business, which is where I'm making my income. Court said originally, no, that doesn't count. Actually, that's not forced marriage. You have to be threatened. Your life and liberty have to be threatened for it to count. And they aren't. You didn't consent enthusiastically but you were reluctantly happy to get married. And that change, the attitude changed in the course of that, um, of that decade is really when it began to shift. So that's really a whistle-stop tour of a few of the most important cases that have come to light of the earlier um, judicial decisions on these cases. Over the past 30 years, we are seeing some common themes you've guessed them quite quickly in the top six countries that would most commonly find forced marriage. Also, the kinds of crimes that are involved in this. You have kidnapping, um, you have people being lured abroad under the, you know, under the uh, misconception of it being a holiday. Typically young, 12, 13, 14, up to 18, 19 year olds who go away. They're going back to their roots for two, three months over the summer holidays, and then they're kept there, passport removed, trapped in the country without any known recourse, um, and then married off. They come back, or they don't come back at all. And I'll talk more about what happens to, uh, to those victims in those cases, but moving on, the other common theme the sort of emotional blackmail we've already touched on, also harassment. After marriage, you'll find that a lot of the in-laws are targeting the victim, um, and forcing the victim to live in a state that's quite similar to slave labour. And then you have cases of rape. This isn't often talked about, because it's not a nice topic to discuss, but there are cases where, and they're very, very rarely reported, where women come forward and quite bravely are willing to discuss the fact that they have been repeatedly raped. Now, in one case, probably the most terrible that I didn't deal with it, that I've come across while I've been reading, um, and the husband repeatedly raped the woman until he got her pregnant. <coughs> the whole reason being, you can probably guess it, is that he wanted to make sure she was pregnant so he could get a visa without it being challenged and come and immigrate into the country. That must happen a lot more than we are aware of. But unfortunately, people aren't willing to discuss it. And the main reason for that is because we don't have enough discussion within the community on this. Um, I'm going to whiz through this now because I think I'm running out of time. But at present, and you'll see the dates on these, we have the Force Marriage Unit, which only started in 2005. Um, the Force Marriage Civil Protection Act. Now, this is an act which gives courts the chance to make force marriage protection orders. These are orders which are, you can't define them because they're very specifically tailored for the victims and what the victim needs. 2007, it's not been in place very long, so people don't know about it enough. But now we have the Antisocial Behaviour Crime and Policing Act. <coughs> That's implemented last year, and it criminalises forced marriage, which was already a crime in parts, you know, rape, kidnapping, harassment, these are all existing crimes, but forced marriage itself wasn't a specific offence, and that's what this act did. I'm going to quickly try and inform you um, on some of the tools that we have available, because you really need to know about these. These are the things that I hope you will remember and will take away with you. Prevention is better than cure. Schools do not know about these tools enough, not just teachers, but also border control, individuals like yourself with friends or family who may be affected by this, can report anyone that they suspect may become a victim of forced marriage. You report it, and the courts have the opportunity to then give an injunction preventing that person from being taken abroad. Have an injunction preventing certain people from taking certain action which might be assisting or enabling the forced marriage. Um, you can prevent the celebration of a marriage. So that's basically consummating marriage itself. 
you can have niqahs, for example, in Islam, which can happen months before or after, depending on what kind of family you are dealing with. But the act of consummation of you never really know exactly when that might be, and courts can prevent that happening. Um, protection after it's reported. Now, people often forget once it's been reported, the victim still needs help. They might want to conceal their address. They might want to prevent, and this is really important, the parties or the perpetrators from being allowed to discuss these issues outside to other members of the community or outside of the family, or sharing the documents, the papers, the court papers, which might include the witness statements with people outside the, with people outside of the family. Obviously, this is a crime which stigmatizes the victims. It can cause the victim to be ostracized from the community, and you don't want that to happen. And there are measures you can take from you know, prevent it from happening. Then you have remedies after forced marriage is reported, and this is really where the bulk of it comes. So you can now criminally prosecute the perpetrators. You can apply to have the marriage uh, nullified because the consent wasn't valid. You can apply for civil remedies where you basically have torts such as trespass and harassment that I've already mentioned. People don't often know about the last one though, damages. So in a case you had a victim who was able to claim £35,000 because as the judge described it, she went through four months of hell, having been targeted by the mother-in-law. Now, we all don't like mother-in-laws, but in this particular case, this mother-in-law was especially, um, especially vindictive. And so this victim was able to get that financial remuneration. Now, people don't often go after that because the victims often are going to be dealing with perpetrators that are maybe their parents, their siblings, their relatives, and they don't want that kind of damage. Um, but it's something that's available. Now, I'm just going to quickly end on future. So lastly, but not least, something that you should think about. Did criminalisation of forced marriage help or hinder? Now, Polly won't mind me saying this, but she was pro-criminalising, and I was anti-criminalising it. Now, that bill was passed in with a 54% majority, which I don't know about you, but I think is quite marginal. Everyone agreed, though, about 80% of those that were involved agreed that the Civil Act, which gave you civil protection, hadn't been in place long enough, and people didn't know about the measures that they could take under it. And so we didn't know if that would be... We needed more time to see if that was effective. And that's really my view, but there are pros and cons. So the pros of it being criminalised being it deters. Victims know that they have a real tangible, specific defence they can then claim protection under. Um, it assists the victims in that they're able to access maybe greater services. The anti-side of it being that it drives the practice underground. Both victims and perpetrators will not speak about it as openly. Perpetrators will find ways around it. You know, there is a real risk now that perpetrators may go to countries like Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Iraq, and keep the victim there, because they know that they'll be prosecuted here, and it's a quick way of evading any prosecution. That's just one of the concerns, but there are, we don't know at the moment whether it, it has helped or hindered. It only came into effect last year. We need more time, not just for this one, but the Civil Act. Now, is forced marriage an immigration issue? The Conservative government, I can imagine this is going to be more te topical than it might otherwise be, but it's an issue you need to think about. And are other countries implementing measures better now? If I had more time, I would go through how other countries are dealing with forced marriage. Um, and it may be something we can come back to in the Q&A, but I'll move over to Polly now. Great, thank you very much, Mano. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Polly, and I'm from the Sharon Project. Um, Sharon means shelter or protection in Sanskrit, and Punjabi is also the na a leading girl's name. So quite often when people contact us, they can dial the Sharon or email us Dear Sharon. So it's a way of sort of be friendly in access and support. Um, I would like to say thank you to City Circle for having me here today. Um, and I'd like to just spend a few moments talking about Sharon and the work that we do, but also about forced marriage and the impact that has and what we're doing to address that. So just briefly, the Sharon project was set up in 2008 and it specifically was set up to support women particularly South Asian women who have been disowned by their families. So very much women who have already left home and for no reason of their own, their families and their communities have ostracised them quite often for the rest of their lives. So 
What Sharon aims to do is provide support to these women so that they can live independent, successful lives without fear. Um, we do this in, in many ways. Largely, we set up as being an online support network, and we thought we could find, create a site for women to go in, access information, and then leave. Very quickly, we realised that wasn't enough and that we needed to do more. So we set up um, some outreach work with clients, we, to do some advocacy in crisis intervention, we also set up an information line um, for professionals to access information because sometimes asking culturally sensitive questions is not always <coughs> available within certain sectors such as social services and the police, so asking somebody who may be able to support them was our approach. Um, we also run educational programmes and awareness programmes through our projects and I'll mention that in a moment. Um, the reason we set up Sharon as being supporting South Asian women who have been disowned was very much because we found that through the exist firstly there was a, a gap in support provisions available for women. If you're experiencing domestic violence there was a support service. If you're experiencing um, a forced marriage there was service provision. But what happens afterwards? What happens when you, the police are finished, the courts are finished, you've left a refuge and you're still very much on your own? So we wanted to ensure that we don't place labels on women for whatever reasons they are now on their own, we will support them. So some of those no labels, if you like, are, are things like forced marriage and domestic violence, but it's also cultural conflict. Some of our clients have had to flee because of their sexual orientation or having a relationship with someone out of their faith um, or community. Also, if they have children out of wedlock or have been groomed and as a result have been blamed for that. Um, quite often there's a lot of issues around rejection and neglect and so we work with women around that as well. And obviously there's issues around honour and dishonour and even if it's not actually an act but it's perceived to be dishonourable, a woman can be very much um, isolated. Um, and also issues around their, their actual family framework being broken. Um, now for our clients, some of the main fears that they have, firstly it's being found out. They've spent pretty much most of their life in hiding, in the shadows, making sure they're not found. So quite often they're isolated and disengaged um, from society and from their friends and communities because they've been removed from all that. Quite often they have to move location, change names, take on jobs that perhaps wouldn't match their aspirations previously but because they want to remain under the radar. They also fear largely not being believed quite often because when sometimes they do disclose, they're often blamed for being a victim. Or they feel guilty for having put their parents through the, the, um, you know, the issue of having to have left home, when the reality is it's the perpetrators who need to take action for their behaviour and not the individual. Um, and the other thing that they do, and they do extremely well, is trust no one and tell no one. So for us to be able to work with these women, we know that when they pick up the phone and they send us a, an email, when they get in touch with us, that it may well be the first time they've actually accessed support. Now, I know Siobhan has very perfectly discussed what the definition of forced marriage is, but what I'd like to do just very briefly is talk about what some of the motivating factors are that we come across as to why young people are being forced into marriage. Um, for some, it's around money. Now, this will be with relation to dowry. We have dealt with cases of dowry-related violence where women have been brought over to the UK for their dowry as soon as they've taken the gold and the money and demanded further money from the family because she's a cheap bride, they've then cancelled her sponsorship, um, sponsorship papers and then demanded that she's be deported back to her family in a dishonourable way. Um, it's also with relation to money to pay off loans. So some families owe other families money and so they make a deal to say, well, you can marry my, my daughter can marry your son when the time comes. Another issue that we see a lot is about land and status. And quite often, keeping the land within the family is another means of ensuring that families marry within. Um, another issue that we look at is, and this is something that we see an awful lot on, is around perceived dishonourable behaviour. Now, that sounds like quite a generic thing, but it could be anything from wearing Western clothes or wanting an education to actually standing up to be a feminist or you know, wanting to be equality or really not a choice or a say in their life. And to curb that behaviour, to curb that mindset, quite often a marriage is seen as a way of making that person's behaviour better. 
Um, now, we know that South Asian women are less likely to seek support, so, but we also know that when it comes to the statistics, last year the forced marriage unit dealt with nearly 1,300 cases of forced marriage. That's just the forced marriage unit. There are different organisations all across the UK who also have their own statistics, but we don't have a collective way of getting that data. We do know that it's on average we're, we're, we have around five to 8,000 forced marriages in the UK every year. But that's because there's a lack of other well, there's a lot of under-reporting and there's a lack of coordinated um, statistic gathering. Um, we also know that um, one in four South Asian women will experience domestic violence in their lifetime. That's a quarter of everyone in this room, female. Um, we also know South Asian women are more likely to self-harm than any other group in the UK. And the correlation between um, self-harming um, and, and mental health is very much linked statistically and research based with, um, sorry, <laughs> uh, very much connected to um, mental health and domestic violence. Um, we also know that two women every week are murdered as a result of domestic violence in this country. Domestic violence is, includes honour abuse and forced marriage. So two women every week will be murdered in the UK, um, either by a partner or a former partner. The cost of um, an investigation for every single murder is around about a million pounds. So if we've got over 52 women being murdered every week, that's 52 million pounds that are, we're having to invest in to, for investigations through um, the NHS, through the police service and the courts and so on. So again, it's not, it is very much about the individuals, but it's also about the cost of not doing anything that is um, important as well. We know that 85% of women are raped in England and Wales every year. We also know that the um, success rate on prosecution is significantly less, and again, we feel that more needs to be done there. But coming back to, to the work that we do, we also know that there is one <coughs> honour killing that takes place every month, on average 12 a year. We know that's the tip of the iceberg, but because of the under-reporting, we don't have the full statistics. It could be because it's made to be seen as um, an accident or a suicide. Quite often, women are taken abroad and not to return, and then we don't hear what has actually happened. So just very quickly, a little bit about what we're doing to um, tackle these issues. Obviously, as we've explained, we do a lot of work with our clients. Because we're largely an online support network, we work with clients all across the UK, from Scotland, Wales, Surrey, and everywhere in between, in order to ensure that where women want to access support, they have our help. Just as a, an indicator, since we set up the website to probably last until six months ago, we've had over half a million visitors to our site, which includes around a 40% conversion rate of people actively accessing links and information. So that tells us that we're doing something right, and that tells us there is clearly a demand for the work that we're doing. We also do a lot of work with governments around lobbying, and as um, has been mentioned, we were in favour of divorce marriage being a criminal offence. Um, we can discuss that in the q and if that's something we wanted, but we also work with um, Her Majesty's Inspectorate Constabulary looking at the way police report and report on abuse, violence and crimes. We work with the Children's Commission to look at um, child abuse and, and grooming within certain communities. We work with the Foreign Office and the Force Marriage Unit in managing rescues and also supporting women once they've either been returned to the UK or have gone through their services as well. In addition to that, we work with the Home Office um, with regards to assessing and identifying what we need to do as a collective sector around vulnerable adults. We also run a series of campaigns, and um, as you've walked in, we may have, you may have had a chance to make a pledge and to, um, to say why you challenge forced marriages. That was part of our Harnessing Change programme, which looked at getting people, civil society, moving to make a difference. So we have global and community ambassadors across the UK who go out and advocate on our behalf. We also have a campaign around um, tackling forced marriages in universities which is the age where the largest proportion of women will face forced marriages. Um, and <coughs> we have some, some of our um, Sharon Project um, volunteers here tonight, so please do feel free to come back and, and talk to us. 
And finally, just to end, um, I just wanted to say there are so many things that you guys can do to get involved. Make a pledge, text donate, and we'll see some, some posters along. Facebook, Twitter, talk amongst the communities. Don't hide these issues. If it's not you who's been affected, it might be somebody sitting next to you who's family at work. And if they know where to go to access support, then it could make all the difference between life and death. So thank you. Um, just to end, we've got a short video set of slides uh, and then we'll move on to our final speaker, actually.